He's in Nairobi at the moment. He's attending a biker's Sunday in Nairobi. So he sends his greetings. Um, you may take your seats. So, uh, once again, you're most welcome to today's service. Um, you can take a moment, just turn to your immediate neighbor, say hello. If you don't know their name, ask them what their name is. Give them a compliment. We're going to be learning together, so you're going to be sharing a lot with them as we go along. Yeah, maybe another thing, I'd like to see those who are new. If you're here today for the first time, kindly wave to me. I'd like to see you. Yes, you're most welcome, you're most welcome. Most welcome. Yes, you're not visitors to us. We take you as family members. So please feel at home. Take that seat and keep it. Even next week it will be waiting for you. Okay. All right. Yeah, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a teacher of the word. I, um, I, I teach, I lead the School of Christian Growth here at Community Life Church. And maybe I can take this moment to announce to all of us that we have started our new semester for this year. There are a number of classes which are running every Friday, and we are all encouraged to be part of these classes. These classes help us to grow in the knowledge of who God is to us. Amen? Personally, I'm teaching a class called Strategy for Living. And this class is a very good class. It's helping us to strategize for our lives. You know we are Christians, right? And um, as a Christian, you can't just live your life anyhow. But the way you want to live it, you need to guide yourself. You need to strategize for it. So that class is very good. And there are so many other classes. There are principles of discipleship. We are discipling church. There's one on uh, Christian character and conduct. Yeah? The one of Christian character and conduct is a very good one because it, it teaches us to, to walk in the, in the character that God has called us to walk in. And um, let me not go into the lesson so deeply. But all in all, I encourage all of you to come in every Friday. We have a refresh service from 5 o'clock. Then at about 6, we go into our classes. And those classes are very good, so please be a part of those. Yes. So once again, I want to take this opportunity to thank Pastor Henry and Pamela Mugisha, our spiritual parents, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, this, week, this week, we had effective communities going out into the community. Every last Wednesday of the month, what we do we don't meet in this, the homes that we meet in, but we always go out on Wednesday and we speak to the people in the community. We evangelize. And this Wednesday, we had 23 people give their lives to Christ during the evangelism. Those are 23 souls that have changed their destiny. 23 people who have come to know the goodness of the Lord. So please ensure that you are in EC. Being in EC is a very powerful thing. It's a very enlightening thing. And um, EC, basically, effective communities are homes which are near where you stay that we meet every Wednesday, every week. On Sunday like this, it's very difficult to, to get all your questions answered. You might, you might have a point you want to raise. You might have a question about something, but you will not get that opportunity so easily. But in the small groups, when we meet on Wednesday, you're able to talk to people, you're able to build meaningful relationships, you're able to, uh, to grow and share whatever you have to share. So please be a part of that. Well, um, this is the year of restoration, right? And uh, this January, we were, we, were, we were learning about personal restoration. Pastor Henry gave us some very powerful messages on personal restoration. He told us that it is important for us to prepare our hearts to receive what God has prepared for us. And so January we spent it trying to have a right relationship with God, trying to rebuild our intimacy with God. We had our 21 days of fasting. We had 21 days of prayer and fasting, and we went through it successfully. Nobody died. I know some people thought there were 45 days at the end of the day, but 
Trust me, there were 21 days only. Yeah, so this month, we are going into a different dimension. We are going to be looking at financial restoration. Financial restoration. I'm very excited. I'm, I can't wait to hear all the messages that are going to come on this topic of financial restoration. But today, I'm privileged to give you the very first of these topics. And our scripture is going to come from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8 to 12. We shall read through the scripture at some point. But maybe one thing I can tell you uh, as a background to these scriptures. In Malachi, in that time, the Israelites refused to give God his proper honor. They refused to give God his respect because they were going through a very tough situation. The Israelites in this season were, were really struggling with life. They were going through a very tough situation. Around that time, the Israelites had been captured by the Babylonians. Back in the day, there were these, um, there were these communities, these, these uh, cultures that tried to take over other people. So the Babylonians had come, and they had captured the Israelites and taken them into captivity. So in other words, they were slaves to the Babylonians. However, that was not all. After a while, the Persians came. The Persians were a different group of people. They came and they, they captured the Babylonians. They came and they, um, they took over the Babylonians. So you can imagine what happened to the Israelites. They became slaves of, you know, the Persians by default. So it was a very tough time for them. However, as time would have it, they were given permission to go back to their homeland and to rebuild the Temple of Solomon. The Temple of Solomon was very important to them. So they went back to their home and they built the temple. However, they found themselves very destitute and poor because, as you know, during the war with the Babylonians, all the infrastructure had been torn down. All the, the, the progress that had, uh, had been put up in their, in their home had been broken down. As you know, when there is a war, everything is broken. People can't build. People can't do business. People can't, they can't really grow their finances. So they were, they were living destitute lives. They were living as poor people. And as a result, they started skimping out on, on God, and they were not following the laws of Moses. They lacked, they lacked the faith. They lacked the faith that, um, that God is able to provide for them. You know, God is Jehovah Jireh. But they, because of the situation they were in, they lacked the faith to really see him as that. And as a result of that, they kept holding on to everything that they had. Whatever little they had, they kept holding on to it much as it was not theirs. I will explain more of that. But let's pray. Let's pray. Father Lord, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you for the word that you're going to share with us this morning. I pray that as your people listen, they may be blessed and that your word will come strongly in their hearts. May we be able to grow in the knowledge of these principles that we're going to be learning today. And we pray, Lord, that it will, we will not live the same. All of us will be touched by your word. We thank you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I hope by now you know that we cannot talk about financial restoration without talking about the principle of tithe, right? We can't talk about financial restoration without highlighting tithing. Now, as a church, we the leaders, we want to take the front line when it comes to tithing and giving. Giving is one of our core values. And I can tell you that Pastor Henry and Pamela Mugisha myself and my wife and all the leaders, this is a, a principle that we practice consistently. The principle of tithing is something that we practice consistently. We want and we encourage one another, we encourage everyone to be at the forefront when it comes to giving in tithes and in offerings. So I want to remind us the definitions of tithing, the definition of tithe and the definition of tithing. The definition of tithe is, I think we can read it together, tithe is 10% of everything that we receive. 10% of literally everything we receive. Some people try to limit tithe to just the salary. But it's not just the salary. If somebody blesses you with 5,000 here, 500 shillings is for the Lord. If somebody even gave you 1K, 
100 shillings is for the Lord. If somebody gave you 100 shillings, I don't know how you'll get the 10, but 10 of it is for the Lord. Amen? Yeah, so literally everything we receive, 10% is the tithe. And tithing is the consistent and faithful paying of the 10%. Consistency is the key word here. You see, when you hear a message on tithing, some people may be moved to tithe. It's January, you tithe. But if the next time you're tithing is September or maybe March, then that is not tithing. That is not consistency. We need to be consistent. Now, the thing about tithing is that it is a revelation. I know very many people have not yet received it. Very many intelligent people have not yet understood what tithing is. Tithing is something that you really need the Holy Spirit to reveal to you. The Bible tells us that the first person, the first mention of tithe in the Bible was in Genesis, and it was Abraham. Abraham is said to have given a tenth of his spoils to Melchizedek, and no one told him to tithe. He, he came up with it. It was a revelation to him, and he gave the, the tithe to Melchizedek, who is the prince of righteousness. And when he did this, he was blessed. All the principles and the blessings that we're going to be talking about today, they followed him as he was, as he was blessed, as he gave his tithe. Now, it is a privilege for us to be able to tithe. The first thing about tithe is that, you know, God has given us what to tithe. We don't tithe out of thin air. We tithe out of what he has given us. And the tithe he has mandated it that it will be used for the progress of the house. We were able to buy this property off the backs of people who were faithfully giving their tithes. We were able to reach out to the 23 people on Wednesday because people have given their tithes and they have enabled us to set up these ECs and to go out and to, and to meet. So we are doing part of what God wants us to do when we tithe. We are pushing the kingdom of God as we tithe. So I want us to read together our scripture of the day from Malachi chapter 3. And verse 8 to 12. Let's read very nice and loud. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me. The whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Amen. Yeah, so in the beginning, in the introduction, I mentioned to you the fact that at this time in Israel's history, they were struggling financially. They were going through a very hard time. And as a result, they had stopped bringing their tithes and their offerings to the temple. They had, they had literally stopped. It was not among their priorities. And it's unfortunate that when people go through hard times, people tend to pull back on certain expenditures. And unfortunately, even church, people stop giving to church. I remember the time we bought the land here. It was during COVID. It was at the height of COVID, and um, the land came available, and we were all called to give. Pastor called upon us and he said, please give generously, give sacrificially, we are going to purchase this land. And many people felt offended. Some people felt that it was probably the wrong time to be buying land. Because, you know, at that time, there was nothing that was known. People didn't know how long the lockdowns would go. We didn't know if we'd ever get back to normal life. And so, because of the struggles, many people were holding back from giving to the church. But... God does not follow the same principles financially that men follow. And so we were able to give and we were able to purchase this land even at the height of, of COVID. So the Israelites, similarly, were not giving and God was not happy. He was not pleased because he had commanded them to give in tithes and to give in offerings. So he was not pleased. However, as we read this scripture, Malachi chapter 3, we, we see that God desires to bless his people. Even at this time, he wanted to bless them. It was his will, it was his heart to be a blessing to them. 
And this is how it is all throughout Scripture. God is a God who wants to bless us. Amen? He wants us to walk in blessings. Now, to be blessed is to have supernatural power working for you. Being blessed means that things happen for you and you, you, know, you don't know how it happened. Um, I remember one time I used to work at a place on Kuruma Road. And that place, if you're late, like at 7.45, you will not find parking on the road. Because there are so many cars and there are very few parking spaces. But somehow, I used to pray that God opens for me a parking. And every time I used to come, I would find either... Yes? I know it was a big miracle. Eh? I would find either a car leaving and I would just park there or I would, you know, as, as, just as I'm coming, somebody will be opening up a slot for me. So I believe, I believe that is part of what they say being blessed is. Being cursed, on the other hand, is having supernatural power working against you. Where every time you have something good that is meant for you, you find that suddenly things disappear and all the blessing disappears. Now, um, when I used to have, when I just started working, I worked for a company which gave me a car. There was a car which was given to me to help me with my work. It was called a Chikumi, Corolla, Toyota Corolla. And this car, one thing about it is that every part of that car can be picked from it and, you know, stolen. And I, my car used to get vandalized quite a lot. I'd park on the road to go and see a customer. I come, I find the side mirror is off. Or I come back and I find, you know, the lights had like four sections. The indicators were separate, so I'd find this indicator gone. And the next week, the other indicator. And then sometimes there were also reflectors and indicators which were, you know, there were two sets of indicators. Basically, that car, almost everything was being robbed. Even if you would rivet them on, things would get robbed. But around that time in my life, I used to tithe. I was a Christian, and I used to go and tithe. However, when I would get the tithe, I used to keep it in the envelope, and I would not take it to church. I would tell myself, you never know what would happen. Maybe I'll run out of fuel, or there would be an emergency. So I would keep it close by. And the whole plan for me was that in case I go through the month and I have an emergency, I borrow from there. But at the end of the month, I would pay it back. But somehow, my life was full of all these incidences. But I thank God that I married a strong woman of God. Yeah? When I got married to Diana, she was, she was in choir at the church where we used to pray from. And she asked me, but John, why don't you just give the tithe there? And I tried to explain to her, you know, anything can happen. You know, sometimes things can happen and, and, and we'll need some money. And she told me, no, this is faith. Just give it there. So I began giving my tithe in faith. And as I began giving it, I don't remember at, one po at what point it was, but my car stopped being vandalized. For long, I, I remember going for many years and nothing was taken out of the car. Even when I would leave it open on the road, nothing would be taken. Actually, there was one time when I, um, I parked the car the whole day and in the car, I had my tithe in the car. I had carried it and I had folded it in a paper and I kept it in the car. And in that car, the, the middle compartment had uh, two, two, two sides. It had the bottom side, that's where I had put the money. But in the top side, I had put a phone, which I used to use for my work. And so I went to work, and I came back later, and I found the car had been opened. The door was actually left open by the thieves. So I began wondering. But the first thing that came to my mind, I was like, hey, God, your tithe is there. I hope you haven't allowed them to take your tithe. So I opened the car, and I opened that middle compartment, and surely enough, the money had been folded in a, in a paper. So I think whoever opened it saw the paper, and he said, ah, this is just a paper. So all the money, every last shilling was there. And so I thought about the phone next, and I, I picked the top compartment, and the phone was there. Clearly, the thief did not know that there were two compartments. He only thought of the one compartment. However, the thief had stolen my, my locks, the locks on the doors, the window locks. All of them were gone. So what I did, I called up um, the insurer. I had an insurance company which uh, I was supposed to insure with at that time. So I called them up and they were on the same street where I had been robbed from. And normally with insurance, what happens is that 
when you make a claim, they have to investigate. They have to see that, you know, you are not cheating the insurance company. And they have to ensure that everything is okay. The whole process can take a whole week. And if there is any problem anywhere, they will not give you your money. But when I called the insurer, they asked me, what has been stolen? I said, the, the window locks. And they told me, hi, you must be in a lot of heat in that car. What you do, just go straight and get it repaired. Go to this garage, they will repair it for free. We shall talk about other things later. And that's what I did. Within an hour, I had everything restored. So that is what happens when we tithe. <laughs> being blessed is having supernatural power working for you. And on contrast, being cursed is having supernatural power working against you. Now we are talking about financial restoration. And I know everybody at some point or another has some form of financial lack in their lives. I don't know where you are right now, but for me, I know areas where I really want some kind of restoration financially. Um, maybe it's even in your family. You might find that some families, there are people who fail to, to maintain a job. I mean, you get a job, but after a short while, it disappears. Maybe in your family, some people cannot run business. You go in one business after another, and things keep failing. I have a good friend of mine who, every time I'd meet him, I would ask him, hey, so how is the, the stationary business? And he told me, ah, no, I left it. That, that business has no profit. People just cheat you. They don't pay. What? So where are you now? I'm now in, in mobile money. Then you find him and ask me, so how is the mobile money business? Say, so, ah, no, I, I got robbed. I, I, that one, I left it. I'm now in this. So these things can tend to follow us. And I don't know what it is, but sometimes it follows us for generation and generation. And you find that in your family, nobody has been able to sustain a good job, or nobody, or even in your own life, you've not been able to, to make it, to make the breakthrough. But I believe that in this month, because it has been declared, and because we are learning, we are going to see the restoration come in our lives. Amen? I believe that there will be promotions. There will be new contracts that are going to come. There will be breakthroughs, financial breakthroughs for many of us if we can obey the things that we are being taught. In the book of Genesis, there, were, there was a story. The Israelites, at some point, were slaves to the Egyptians. For 430 years, they worked for the Egyptians, making them prosperous. But they were working as slaves. They were not being paid. They were mistreated all through these 40 years. And I'm sure they thought to themselves that, that this is a very bad destiny, but it's what was meant for them. They said to themselves, perhaps they were born in the wrong time, and that's why, they are, that's why they are working as slaves. But I want to believe that even in this time, God desired to see the people free. God desired to see them free. I know many of them had lost hope. They knew that their fate in life was to be a slave, and that was the fate of their children and their children's children. But God said that I have seen the afflictions of my people. I have heard their cries, and I am coming down to deliver them. And many of us might be going through a difficulty. Maybe we have been through it for a long time, you know. But I believe God is saying to us as Community Life Church this morning that he is going to come down and restore us. He has seen our afflictions, and he's going to come down and restore us. Well, Moses went to speak to Pharaoh, and when he went to Pharaoh, he tried to let him know that God wants the people to be set free, but Pharaoh wouldn't listen to Moses. We all know the story. I'm not going to read it from the Bible, but Moses kept going back to Pharaoh and asking for the people to be released, and Pharaoh would keep saying no, and God had to send plague after plague onto the people of Egypt and on Pharaoh, and eventually Pharaoh said, it's okay they can go. So you can imagine, after 430 years of being slaves, these people were released to go. They must have been so happy. There must have been a lot of singing. There must have been a lot of dancing. You know, being set free after 430 years was a miracle in itself. The people were so happy. I can imagine they, 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 were, they were really excited about this. But God was not happy. He was not happy enough at that. He mentioned in his word in, um, in Exodus chapter 3, he said that, I will see to it that the Egyptians treat you well, 
They will load you down with gold. They will load you down with silver. They will give you jewelry and clothing. And you will not live empty-handed. Amen? God gave them favor. When they went to their bosses and they asked for these things, they asked for the gold, they asked for the silver, the Bible says that the Egyptians were freely giving to them. They, had, they found favor in the eyes of their slave masters, and they gave them everything. They gave them all their gold, they gave them all their jewelry, they gave them everything they had. So for generations, they were loaded down with burdens. They were loaded down with hard work. But when they were leaving, they were instead loaded down with all this gold, all this silver, all this favor. It was not enough that they were free, but now they had all the riches of their slave masters. And you can imagine somebody who has been working all their lives, you know, as a slave, as a servant, and then now they have gold necklaces, they have wonderful royal clothes. I believe this is the way God wants to, to bless us. He doesn't want us to just be restored to what we, we, we are asking for, what we have lost, but he wants to give us over and above the restoration. Amen? Yeah, we may be discouraged sometimes that, you know, somebody's standing in our way, somebody's limiting us from getting what we desire or what we feel we deserve, but I believe God only needs one move and he will catapult you into the blessing that he has for you. Amen? There have been so many testimonies that have been given in this season alone. Already we are seeing God moving in people's lives. And right now I want to call upon somebody to share with us one testimony from this area. Uh, Juliet, Juliet Nakaiza, please come forward. Get her a microphone, please. Yes. Praise God, church. It's wonderful. I want to thank Pastor Henry and Pamela and Bisha for the yes. opportunity to share my testimony. I also want to thank God for using our pastors teach us these great principles. Yes. Uh, so me, I'm testifying from, from the third, over time I started tithing consistently. I've really noticed supernatural increase at our workplace. Yes, it has been a blessing for me and I've been getting money here and there from unexpected sources right. which I used not to get. Just because I'm a tither, I've really been blessed by people. Yes, and also, uh, previously, I used to spend money without accountability. Mm -hmm. But when I started tithing, my money has been put to use well. Amen. So I just want to encourage each of us here that let us tithe. It is small, but it's bringing more blessings. Yes, Amen. thank you so much, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing your testimony. Yeah, I believe all of us can have a testimony like that. Um, in Malachi chapter 3, God confronted the people of Israel with a rhetorical statement. He said, will a man rob God? This is a very serious accusation. He was saying that his own people are the ones stealing from him. Will a man rob God? And of course their answer was, that, how, how have we robbed you? you know? How have we robbed God? But the people were robbing God because they were not following his commands. They were not tithing. They were not giving in offerings. And um, you'll notice that there is a cycle. When we don't give, we fall into this cycle. I want to share with you a picture. Um, if the people in the room, yes, that's the one. There are two kinds of lifestyles you can have. You can have a lifestyle where you're really struggling with life. There is something called the devourer. The devourer is the enemy, and he comes around, and he, everything you do, you invest your money, it's stolen. You try to buy something, it gets spoiled. You know, you get your salary, then people fall sick. There is the devourer, and so you live a struggling life. And normally what happens is the more you avoid paying tithe, the more the devourer strikes, and the more your life struggles. But on the other hand, you can also be thriving. And the more you, you pay your tithe consistently, the more the devourer is rebuked. We have read in the scripture that when we pay the tithe, the devourer is rebuked. And so it leads us to thrive in life. But there is a point where we make a decision, when the money is in our hands, and we have to make that decision. Should I tithe? Should I not tithe? And depending on which decision you make, that is the kind of lifestyle you're actually asking yourself for. So where that decision is, is where there is 
there is a, a very strong uh, point of control. I believe not paying our tithe is like when we live in these estates, these little estates they call Muzigo. And normally what happens in those estates, these are like people in, a, in the same compound, the different homes. At some point, they all lock their houses and they go to work, right? So you leave your house and you go to work. And the, the Bible tells us that the enemy is like a, a roaring lion. He's moving around looking for who he can devour. So what happens when people leave? It's important that you ensure that your door is locked, that your windows are firmly closed. Because when everyone is gone, a wrong person can come around. The enemy can come around and he starts testing the doors. And if he finds your door open, you can guess who is going to be robbed on that day. So by paying our tithe, I believe we are ensuring that our door of our, our house, our, door, our windows of our music are tightly locked. And so we will not fall victim. Amen? Yeah, so in Malachi, verse 10, starting from verse 10, God explains why he wants people to be faithful. And in his explanation, in this monologue, we find one of the most stunning verses of the Bible. He says, test me in this and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. I believe this is the only area where God tells us we can test him. Yeah? And that is what normally happens. For people who do not have the culture of tithing, it takes a step of faith to test. Let me test and see what God is doing. And trust me, he is calling you to test him. And when we test him, the blessings begin immediately. The restoration comes back immediately. Goes on, God goes on to say that he will make sure that the land is blessed so that the crop yield will be good. He says that the land will be blessed. I believe when he talks about the land, to us it's, it, it reflects where we work. It reflects where we, we do our business, where we, we earn a living from. So if the land is blessed, if our businesses are blessed, then that is a good thing. So he ends this section of scripture by declaring that if Israel follows this command, not only will they be blessed, but they will be a good example for the nations that surround them. In other words, everybody will see what is happening and they will know that, yes, they are blessed. And I believe that's what happens to us even today. When we follow these principles, when God pours out his blessings and his restoration in our lives, we cannot hide it. Everyone will see and they will know that, yes, there is a difference here. I believe it is better for us to, to pay our tithe in pain, you know, and learn to be consistent. Many times you look at our needs so much, but even if the needs are there, the needs are waiting, let's take off the 10%, let's give it there to God, and we shall see what God can do. Financial restoration cannot begin until we begin faithful tithing. Amen? When we do not tithe, the scripture says that we are robbing God. Now, robbing is, is a very big accusation because if I'm walking, for instance, and somebody pulls out my wallet from my pocket and I turn and I can't see him, that person has stolen from me. So that one is not a robber. That one is a thief. However, if it were a robber, a robber would come to me with a knife or, you know, a gun or something and tell me I want your, your, your money. Last Sunday, pastor told us about his friend who took a border ride and the border man turned against him and pulled out a paver and hit him with a paver. Now that is a robber. A robber lets you know that I'm taking your money whether you like it or not. And that is what God is telling us. When we take the tithe, we are like robbers. We are not just you know, stealing a little here and there. We are telling him this is your money, but whether you like it or not, we are taking it. We are almost pulling out the paver. Yeah. So, there are many excuses that we tend to give ourselves. Many excuses. One of the most common excuses people have is that, no, this is my money. I worked for it. You know, I am the one who woke up and went to the office. I'm the one who cracked the deal. This is my money. And I believe, in a way, this is where the Israelites were coming from. They felt that, you know, they had little, and the little was for them. Why did God want it? But I want us to read from. Psalms chapter 24 and verse 1. Psalms chapter 24 and verse 1. It says, the earth is the Lord's. We can read together. 
The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. In other words, everything belongs to, the world, to, to God. Everything in the world belongs to God. Everything that it contains. It goes on to say that even us, we belong to him. So there is nothing we can say that is, 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 not, is ours. God says in another portion of scripture that he's the one who gives us the power to make wealth. Without him, we will not have good health. Without him, we will not have those jobs or those opportunities. So when we say that this is our money, we are actually lying. Everything belongs to God. All he is doing is he's asking us to give back a small portion. And he's generous. He's not asking for 80% or 50%. He's asking us to give back 10%. And the 90% which we remain with will be blessed. Um, God had given the Israelites everything they had. And everything on earth rightfully belongs to him. And it's true for them in that time. But it's also true for us today. Another excuse that people tend to give is that I'm a good Christian, you know? I, I, I don't steal, I don't cheat. Actually, you might even read through the whole Ten Commandments and you keep ticking for yourself. I don't, you know, I honor my parents, I do this and that. And so why must I really tithe, you know? God is going to give me a ticket to heaven because I'm good, right? But I believe God did not tell us to tithe as a recommendation. You can tithe if you want. He told us to tithe as a command. He commanded us that we must not forget tithing. Um, in the New Testament, there was a time uh, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. And the scripture says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. He says, it is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. What he's saying is, what happened at that time, the Pharisees and the scribes, these were the religious leaders of the time, they used to put a lot of emphasis on tithe. They would tithe everything, including these spices that we, we have read here. You get something small, you take off 10% and you tithe it. But they were not doing their job. They were not uh, leading the people with mercy. They were not judging fairly. They were not doing all those things. So Jesus came to them and told them that you have to judge fairly. You have to treat the people with mercy. But at the same time, you must not forget the tithe. In other words, he was saying that, yes, we're supposed to be good Christians, but at the same time, we must not forget to tithe. Being a good Christian will not exempt us from the, the need to have to tithe. Tithing is a, is a law. It's, a, it's an unchanging principle that God has given us, and God is an unchanging God. Amen? I want us to turn to our neighbor briefly and ask them what have they learned so far. What have they learned? Let them tell you. Yeah. All right. I think let's continue that conversation at the end of the service. Tell them that we will carry on from there. We shall catch up from there. I want to talk a bit about the element of obedience. In the book of Luke, Luke chapter 17, from around verse 11, there's a story of lepers. There were some lepers. Leprosy is a, is a very bad disease. What happens with leprosy is that when somebody is suffering from it, their skin begins to, to rot. Their skin begins to decompose. Their, their flesh begins to decompose and they get wounds, all kinds of wounds on their body. And eventually you find that some of their extremities, like the fingers and the toes, they can tend to wither away and even fall off. So they find that they can no longer use their hands because the fingers are off. They, their feet are bad to look at. So back in the day, when somebody had that disease, they used to send them out of the, the town, out of the village because they didn't want them infecting the other people. And one time, Jesus was moving, and he was entering this village, and there were these lepers who saw him. 
And because they had heard that Jesus could bring healing, they began shouting out for mercy, Jesus, come and heal us. Jesus, come and heal us. And so Jesus did not pray for them. He did not touch them. He looked at them and he told them, go and show yourselves to the priest. So you can imagine what was going through their minds. The thing was, whenever somebody was sick, when they got well, before they were allowed back into the city, they had to go back to the priest, and the priest sees them and says, okay, you're well, you can now go. But these people were not yet well. They were still sick, and Jesus was telling them, go and show yourselves to the priests. So you can imagine what was going through their minds. It's very possible that they were saying that, ha, ah, me, I'm still sick. Maybe when I get well, then I will go to the priest. But it was important for them at that moment to realize that it was their obedience that was going to bring about their healing. It was their obedience that was going to, their healing was dependent on their obedience. And many times when God tells us to do something, like now he has shown us the principle of tithe. He has shown us different principles in his word. When he tells us to do something, that is not the time to try and figure it out. You know, you don't go back and figure it out. You don't call 10 of your friends and get their opinion. What do you think? You know, this thing that God is saying. I believe God just wants us to simply obey. When he has given us a principle, he has given us an instruction, we need to simply obey. And for these lepers, as they were going, that's when they started seeing their wounds healing. That's when they started seeing their fingers, which were off growing again. This was a very impossible situation. It was a miracle that when you think about it physically, you imagine that it must have been really out of this world. Their situation was way down, but God healed them, and as they were going, they saw their, their, their fingers grow, they saw their, their skins heal. And I want to relate that to us. You might be in a financial situation today, which in your opinion is really bad. Maybe you're up to your neck in debts, in loans. Maybe you're in school, and even last year's school fees is not yet fully paid, and yet you want to study this year. Maybe the landlord is on your, on your case. You haven't been able to pay him. I don't know what it is, whether it is taxes, whatever it is that looks impossible to you right now. I believe as we obey, as we do what God is telling us to do today, the restoration that we are looking for is going to come our way. Amen? I believe that in this month, as we continue to learn about financial restoration, as we continue to practice, we are going to get unusual breakthroughs in our lives. We are going to get unusual miracles, things like what these, these lepers went through. We are going to find favor and promotion that we did not know we could get, simply because this is the year and this is the month of financial restoration. Amen? Yeah, the enemy can do his best. He can come and take away anything from you. He can come and, you know, steal, kill, and destroy. But God says that he has come to give us life and life more abundant. And the abundant life includes restoration in every area of our lives. Amen? We've declared this year to be a year of restoration. And the Bible tells us in the book of Joel, I want us to read together. Joel chapter 2, verse 25 and 26. Let's read together. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty <clears throat> and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Some of those worms had never heard of them before. The canker worm, the, the palmer worm. I believe what this represents is whatever situation we are going through. Our situations are different. The things I'm going through might not be the same as what you're going through. But I believe it doesn't matter what name it is, what problem it is, or where it might have come from. Whatever it is, we have a God that is willing to restore us. We have a God that is willing to bring us back to restoration over and above where we, we desire to be. Amen? Amen. So I want to speak uh, on a couple of principles of tithing. There are a couple of principles that tithing follows. And the first principle is the first 10% is the redemptive portion. The first 10%. What that means is that when we get our money, 
we have so many needs. For example, if I earn 500,000, I have rent maybe of 50,000, I have um, areas of school fees I need to pay maybe for one of my children, I have so many things, but I also have my tithe, which is 10%, and 10% 10 of 500,000 is 50,000, right? Yeah, so the first 50,000 that I take off my, my salary is the first portion, and that is the one that needs to go to tithe. Even if I pass by the landlord before I, I, I reach CLC, I have to first take off my 50 for tithe and put it away and then pay the landlord. They say in the word of God that the first portion, the first of the first fruits, this is Exodus chapter 23 and verse 19. It says, the first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. In other words, it's the first portion that God wants. It means that the last portion, the last 10% is not the first fruit. It's not acceptable. Even the second 10%, it needs to be the first. In other words, it should be on your mind at the time you're receiving your money. Just count your money and know that 10% of that is the first thing to give away. The scriptures also go on to tell us in Romans chapter 11 and verse 16. It says, if the part of the door offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. What this means is that if the, the money you bring to church is holy, then all your finances are blessed. And the holy part we have already seen, it's the first part. So you might bring your money, but it's not the first money you're bringing, you know? So God wants to receive the first portion. The first portion is the one that redeems the rest. This is a principle that we need to practice. It's not something to, uh, that is limited to only born against. Whoever practices this principle will be blessed. Whoever is able to give the first of, of their earning to the, to the Lord. Many times we find ourselves fearing, you know, the landlord. We fear the URA. We fear police. We fear different people more than we fear God. And so we get our money, we spend it, we give it away and what, and then at some point when we remember, hey, Tomorrow is Sunday, I need to take some tithe. So you calculate quickly 10% and you bring it. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. All money is unclean as we spend it. It can, it can disappear. They say riches have wings. However, when we give the first portion to God, it sanctifies the rest. Um, the lady who came here and gave a testimony says that now she's able to account for all her money. It's possible for you to earn the same amount of money but without tithing, you might not be able to account for all of it. However, when you're able to account for it, when you're able to give your tithe, you'll find that accounting for it is very easy. So the first portion is the redemptive portion. Another principle is on where we pay our tithe. Where do we take our tithe? Verse 10 tells us that bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. I believe that... Um, the storehouse is the place where we are planted. It's the church where we are planted. And it's important for all of us to be planted in a church. Being planted in a church makes us thrive. The Bible says that he who is planted like a tree, who is, who, who, ha, it's like a tongue twister. But let me paraphrase it. He who is planted in a church will be like a tree that is planted by the river. You'll be able to give fruit in and out of season, right? So he wants us planted in church. God wants us to be, and you cannot be planted in more than one place, right? You cannot be planted in this church, and then you say you're also planted twice a month in another church. We have to be planted in one place where we can participate, where we can be a blessing to the people around us, and where we can also eat and feed, right? So we need to give our tithe to the place where we are planted, to the home where we are planted. Uh, Pastor gives this example often. He says, it's like if you go to, to 2K restaurant or to Cafe Java's and you eat and the meal is so good and you're so happy and you're like, hey, these people have cooked well. Let me pay them for their meal and let me even give them a tip. But you decide instead of paying to them, you go to Sheraton and pay from there. It will be ridiculous, right? They will not even allow you to leave the premises. You have to pay in the place where you have eaten. So similarly, we give our tithe in the home, in the, in the storehouse where we have fed from. 
We do not pay to TV ministries. We do not pay to uh, destitute people on the street. When we give those people money, it's a good thing, but that is charity. We are giving them a blessing. But when we, are, when we talk about tithe, tithe has to be brought to the house where we are fed from. Amen? And tithe is given in faith. It's given in faith. It's not that you need to wait to get out of this cycle of, of suffering and you get into a cycle of plenty and then now you can bring your tithe. You bring your tithe in faith and God will restore you. I've had so many testimonies of people who have given their tithe in faith and God has done wonderful things in their lives. We have a sister, uh, my wife's sister. She told us at some point that she used to put money aside for hospital because every month without fail, her children used to fall sick. So she used to put money. When she gets her money, she puts some aside and says, no, this is for hospital. So my wife encouraged her to begin tithing. And she, she followed the instruction and she gave it a try. She began tithing. And in a few months, she realized that the money she was putting aside for hospital was accumulating. It was becoming more and more. And it was at that point that she realized that, oh my God, because I am tithing, now my kids are not falling sick. She realized that God was restoring her finances by ensuring that her children remain healthy. Amen? And she gave us that, that testimony very happily. There is another lady who we, we know, and um, she used to pay school fees. She was the firstborn in their family. So she was paying school fees for her brother. She had just gotten a job. So literally all her money she was earning was going for school fees. And the boy was not studying well. He was in secondary school, but he was failing, you know, every now and then. And so she worried because she knew time is going to come and he's going to go to the university. And when he goes to university, the, the, the tuition in university would be a lot more than what she was paying. And yet she had to pay for him. So she, she, she used to think about it with a lot of fear in her heart that she will have no money. So this gentleman went and sat for his A-level. And he surprised everybody. He passed so well, he got a government sponsorship of a very good course at the university. And this lady, when she came to church, she immediately knew that it's because of the tithe she was giving that God had spared her the burden of having to pay university tuition. And it takes wisdom, it takes understanding to see and correlate that because of the tithe, God has actually restored. There is nothing too hard for God to do. And even if your situation might look impossible, it doesn't matter where you're starting from. God has all the power. He knows what we have been through and he's going to restore us back to our financial restoration if we are able to, to do what he says. Amen? So as we become consistent in paying our tithe, I believe God is going to, to restore us fully. I want to conclude today. I want to conclude by giving us some applications. What can we do now that we have heard this message, now that we have been reminded about the tithe? I want to read, I want us to read together actually from Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 14 to 15. This was after God had freed the people from, from slavery. Let's read together. It says, In days to come, when your son asks you, What does this mean? Say to him, With a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my 130 years. But they are giving their first fruit. Well, let us give happily, give willingly. But more than that, let us pass on this principle to others. The scripture says, when your son asks you. Right now, we, some of us have children. Let's teach that principle to our children. Some of us have spiritual children, people who look up to us, people who we are discipling. Let's pass on that principle to them. Let's explain to them what they need to do and how they can do it. So our biological children, our spiritual children through discipleship, our workmates, the people who are around us, let us share this word with them and let us all be blessed. Amen? Amen. I hope you received that word today. 
If you receive it, I want to declare that it's going to be true in your life. Amen. So I want us to stand up for a minute and pray. Yeah, before we pray, I want to ask if there is anybody here who has not given their life to Christ, um, I would like to give you an opportunity. I would like to pray with you. If you're here today, you've not, you're not born again, you've not given your life to Christ, I would like you to raise your hand. I will see that hand and we will pray together and you can give your life to Christ today. Is there anybody? Anybody? This is a very big step. We've all done it, but it changes your life. I believe it's the beginning of restoration. We were taught in the previous month that for us to receive what God has given us is preparing for us. We need to be ready in our hearts. And one of the best ways to be ready is to present ourselves in his presence and give our lives to him. Is there anybody? Anybody would like to give your life to Christ today? We are all born again. Yes, my sister. Amazing. Thank you, Pastor, for that wonderful sermon. Now, here at Community Life Church, we believe that the highest form of learning is application. So go back and apply this word in your life. If this is your very first time watching with us today, you're very welcome. Please get in the comment section and let us know where you are watching from. Now, if you haven't received Christ in your life, if you haven't received Christ in your life, we would like to let you know that it's the best decision that you can ever make. So wherever you are right now, please repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I've done many things wrong. And I know that you came and died for my sins. Father, I welcome you today into my life. Come in to stay and be my personal Lord and Savior forever and ever. Amen and amen. If you say that prayer, I would like to let you know that you are born again. Now what you need to do, write to us. Write to us using the email address on your screen and we would like to help you get started on this new journey that you'll be walking with Jesus Christ. Here at Community Life Church, we celebrate giving and generosity is one of our core values. We would like to thank each and every one of you that has financially come alongside the vision that God has given to us. And we would like to let you know that when you have the chance to give, you can use the different platforms that are availed right now on your screen. You can give through bank, you can give through mobile money, Airtel or MTN. And if you live around the church area, you can always pass by and drop that gift in the church gift box. Thank you for joining us today. Have a good week.